Hello, welcome to Radio NIGP. We're so happy to have you join us again today. My name is Bobby Tolston, and here at Radio NIGP, the topic for today is what happens after an emergency? How often are we sitting at our desk working on this last minute project that we needed to get ready uh, for approval, either by our next level supervisor or the board, and someone walks into our office and they say, I've got an emergency and I need your help. Well, what do you do? Depending on the agency that you work for, you're going to do something different to put out that fire. Your agency requirements are the first order of business when someone has an emergency. The first thing I do is ask, is this an emergency or is this an urgent need? Well, making that determination may be your first step in putting out that fire, but stick around and listen to my friends here on the show today, and I'm sure they'll share with you some other ideas that you can use to determine when is the emergency over. Thank you so much for joining us here today and have a great day. Hello, NIGP colleagues, and welcome to another session of Hot Topics on Radio NIGP. And uh, this month, in this session, we're asking the question, when does when is the emergency over? So, Don, uh, what's the situation in your state, in your agency? Well, I, th I think the first thing I want to talk about is the answer is, when is the emergency over? It depends. I mean, it really does. It depends on what your statute says, um, how, what the declaration says, what the emergency is. Um, you know, in, in our state, in most states or most cities, counties, whatever, have an emergency definition. First thing you want to do is become familiar with that. Ours, of course, has the, you know, normal fire, flood, explosion, storm, ep epidemic, earthquake, etc. But ours also includes this statement. When the delay incident to obtaining competitive bids could cause adverse impact upon the governing authorities or agency, its employees or its citizens. So we have to look at that as, you know, what happens if we go through the normal bid process? So there's situations that are clearly emergencies that um, like, okay, if, if a roof blows off of a chicken house, we have to get that re roof replaced immediately to protect the animals inside. Okay, when we get that roof on, the emergency is over. You've got other situations like when Katrina hit, um, you know, we had emergency situations for weeks, months, you know, beyond that. But there comes a time when that emergency is over and you don't have to go through a, you know, don't have to make that emergency purchase. You can go through the normal bid process. So that's the key, in my opinion, is look at the situation. And if going through the bid process would cause harm to your citizens, your employees, your equipment, whatever, then you possibly can look at it as being an emergency. But if not, go through the normal bid process because that's what we're supposed to do. So that's just my quick thoughts on it. Um, Kevin, what do you think? So I think instead of answering that question, let me just share a quick story of, um, uh, of a project manager uh, trying to push through a project that was uh, uh, and declared an emergency and so, and that it had to do with um, uh, sewer pipes. So, when during their inspection, their normal inspection uh, with the consultant, um, they found out that the um, the lining, or actually the pipes itself, the um, is no longer there. It's just dirt, right? And so. Um, uh, this was when I was in the Northwest and it rains a lot up there and, um, and, uh, and when it rains, these pipes could collapse because it's just dirt. Right. And so, um, we, 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 uh, and, and this was happening the, 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 um, there's no, there's no pipes, uh, through many sections of, um, of, uh, the, the sewer. Uh, system, and so um, 
what I asked them was, you know, if 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 the if it collapses, what would happen? Well, what would happen would be that the um, uh, the sewer water would actually back up uh, back up into uh, people's home through showers and any any orifice, <laughs> and that's a bad thing because um, it, uh, 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 it 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 would ruin their their home uh, the, the 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 residential homes. And so, so what I, the next question I asked was, um, uh, if, if it happened though, do we have any way to mitigate that issue? Um, could we divert any of the, uh, uh, the sewer water, sewage water, uh, to other pipes? And, and the, the answer was yes, we could, but the issue there was that because it's happening all over, um, it could, um, we, if, if, mo if more than uh, one or multiple uh, pipes collapses, uh, collapse, then um, it would overwhelm the system and that's just not going to happen. And so, um, so there is a potential for an emergency purchase. So what I asked the project manager was, um, it, could, we, um, could we go through the normal process the normal procurement process, and if it does happen during that, um, while we're doing this procurement process, um, we could declare an emergency. Is that okay? And the project manager contemplated and thought, okay, yeah, we we could give it a try, right? Um, and uh, and uh, the 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 long and short story of that was that we went through the entire process. Um, actually, even went during the construction. Um, uh, it never collapsed, and so which is good because the uh, the process worked, and we uh, we utilized the normal process, the normal procurement process, to get to that contract. Yeah. And I think Kevin raises an interesting point. There is we uh, procurement folks kind of become the gatekeepers here, and and have to ask the question those kinds of questions. Uh, we had a situation in Fort Lauderdale where uh, we had, we declared an emergency for a hurricane. Uh, we took off the controls on our um, PCARD program and, and raised the limits from $1,000 to $10,000. And somebody went out and promptly bought themselves a, a small generator for $7,500 and took it home and stuck it in the garage. Uh, I mean, he was, he was eventually bought and terminated. But it, Kevin raises a very good point there. We have to ask the question, what, what's going on? Why is, or why might this still be an emergency? And can we use our normal procedures or do we have to keep uh, following the, the uh, emergency procedures and essentially just people going where they, where they wanna go? Uh, Don? Yeah. Well, I mean, Kevin, what you can brought up is a potential emergency, no question about it. But until the emergency happens, it's, we're hard pressed to be able to go that step and say, yes, this is truly an emergency. I mean, but then on the other end, you've got situations where you've got like COVID. COVID happened, started, who knows, 18, 20, 20 months ago, whatever it is now. And at that time, purchasing things related to COVID was truly an emergency, but but now it should be commonplace and we shouldn't be continuing to use that emergency declaration. But part of the problem I think is that emergency for funding purposes, it's still an emergency declaration for funding purposes. We can turn in um, expenses and get funding you know, from the federal government. So a lot of people are looking at that and say, well, it's still an emergency, we're getting the funding for it. But emergency funding and emergency procurement are two different things. And we've got to make sure we, like you said, if we're the gatekeeper, we have to keep yes. people aware of that and make sure that we go down the right path. Because if good public procurement policies and procedures are available and we have time to do them, we should always do them. You know? Yeah, I think that's, uh, those are all really good points. So um, I hope you all got, uh, something out of this discussion today, and we look forward to seeing you uh, again on our next uh, Radio NIGP Hot Topics session. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Hello, 
and welcome to Way to Grow, an NIGP mentorship moment. During my career, I've been fortunate enough to have many mentors who guided me to where I am today. And thanks to that guidance, I'm at the point in my life where I can now give back to the profession. Today, a little different for us. Uh, I'm going to talk to someone who I'm delighted to chat with, one of my own personal mentors whose advice was particularly helpful to me when I had to respond after an emergency, which happens to be our topic this month. I'd like you to meet Mr. Fred Mark, CPPO, VCO, a retired purchasing officer who has held positions as a supervising buyer for the Port Authority in New York and New Jersey, as well as the Director of Material Management for Northern Virginia Community College. You may remember that Fred was also a featured writer for Government Procurement Magazine from 2006 to 2013, where his advice, wit, and wisdom were shared in the coveted back page feature article from April 2006 to May 2013. So, Fred, I want to welcome you to Radio NIGP and to the Way to Grow segment. Well, thanks, Keith. I'm uh, happy to uh, participate in this, and hopefully pe people will learn a little something of uh, how bad things can be and how you cure them. So, Fred, this month our theme is after the emergency is over. And some of the best advice that I ever received as a mentee was advice that you gave me about how to respond after an emergency based on your real life experience after the first bombing of the World Trade Center back in 1993. I think your audience would be very interested in your response to a few questions that I have. All right, Keith, uh, ask away. Uh, yeah, remember it was 1993 and technology was not where it is today. That's right. And that's why it'll be so interesting to see how the environment was before we had modern day FEMA and other types of organizations and processes and procedures to follow after an emergency. So during those very difficult days following the bombing, can you tell us the types of actions that you took to respond to the situation? Uh, yeah. Um, first of all, we had, uh, we at the Port Authority had set up an emergency control center in the basement of uh, the World Trade Center, which was still uh, fairly much intact. We uh, staffed it with people who could get work done. Uh, personally, as the purchasing guy, I didn't worry about delegated authority. I didn't worry about purchase limits. I didn't worry about bid limits because my job was to get other people the tools that they needed to do their jobs. After it was all over, again, remember it was 1993, we wrote a lot of memos and a lot of uh, this is what we did type of stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. And we set up protocols for uh, hopefully if it ever happens again, uh, we were lucky it didn't. Uh, we were just very lucky. We staffed the uh, the emergency control center with people who knew how to get things done. Uh, most of our technical experts, and that's really what we needed. We had very few administrators like myself, but we had super engineers, uh, guys who knew the inside workings of say a motor control center or a substation or the uh, HVAC systems. And uh, we did what we needed to do went with our training and went with our instincts. Uh, that's right. And it must have been very interesting and trying at the same time. Um, just curious, this is well before FEMA and all those types of organizations and a lot of process and government for disaster mitigation was not in place yet. So what type of support did you receive in trying to get the job done? The most interesting well, the support that I got was from everyone. Uh, people were calling me from all over the country saying, what can we do? Uh, the president at the GE called me and said, whatever we have on the line is yours. And uh, I found out later that people were telling me uh, they, would, they would send us whatever they had. There were people who had extra electrical equipment so we could keep the generators going. Uh, there were people who had uh, railroad parts because our railroad was out of service. It was, uh, 
it wasn't just us. It was the whole country. Uh, I think the country was in shock at what had happened. Uh, we're just very, very lucky. Uh, more people weren't killed. We were very lucky that we were able to get World Trade Center, both both buildings, back online, uh, fully staffed in six weeks. Well, how, how does your own past experience help you when you were responding to the situation? I had been a buyer in the electronics industry and the electrical construction industry before I went to the Port Authority. So I fairly much knew when they said uh, we needed a double-ended substation. I knew what they were talking about, and I knew how to go about getting one. Uh, we wrote spe The engineers wrote specifications literally on yellow pads, and I would fax them. And you have to remember, again, 1993, fax was a great technology. Uh, we didn't realize, you know, we had no concept of what computers would do today. What we'd write specifications on literally scraps of paper. I'd fax them over to people. I'd get handwritten quotes, and we went with those. That's what we used for our evaluations. You know, it's it was uh, they were interesting times. <laughs> <laughs> well, a uh, final question is: What did you learn from this experience that you think could help current public procurement professionals deal with similar situations? You know, that's a really good question. Uh, what I personally learned was you've got to go with your instincts. Uh, the best thing you can do is, is spread the information around. Uh, work on, after it's all over and you've got time to take a breath, write down what you would have done. Write down what you what you think you did wrong. You probably didn't do anything wrong but you probably felt that you did something wrong. So write down a protocol, uh, see what you want to do next time, follow it, rehearse it, and refine it. Uh, it's the best thing you can do. And put good people in charge. Okay, that's fantastic advice. So, Fred, I, I want to thank you for taking the time to chat with me today and Way to Grow. And just a reminder, audience, that you can find the NIGP Mentorship Program as well as our mentorship Facebook page at www.nigp.org slash events slash mentorship. And so now this is Keith Glatt speaking and hoping that you'll join me soon here on Radio NIGP for another segment of Way to Grow and reminding you that this is Radio NIGP. <laughs>Well, hey, Mike Beavis, we've been asked to share with Radio NIGP some legal speaking about when emergencies arise and end. So uh, I know there's a couple components to this, but you had a great story about emergencies in a procurement context. Share that with us. And hello, Richard Pennington, and, and thank you for the intro. And, uh, and yeah, I'd like to talk about a specific example, but before I get into that, I'd talk like to talk about a distinction that people don't always get. And it's a legal distinction in my mind, but it's also a jurisdictional distinction. And that is the difference between an emergency in the sense of procurement rules and when procurement rules apply and how they might be suspended or loosened and an emergency which invokes outside funding. And with that outside funding, possible rules that have to be followed. So for example, I have emergencies weekly in my organization, right? And those emergencies are true emergencies and they create, in our definition of emergency, they created immediate threat to life or property, right? And they're important challenges that need to be resolved. And those emergencies are dealt with on a case by case basis. I also have an ongoing emergency called a pandemic, which is something that was declared by outside people, which my governor had a role in, the president had a role in, all these people had a role in. And some of that invokes special procurement rules. Some of it doesn't. It depends, right? And, and that's something I think we can talk about after my example, because my example is one of those specific local emergencies, which was an immediate threat to property and a potential threat to life, which is we had a situation where after a rainstorm and not a hurricane, not anything giant, 
But after a rainstorm, some stairs started to subside and were starting to tip over and collapse. So we had to fix them because people would fall down the stairs and or the building was in danger. And what happened in that emergency was we approved an emergency to fix the stairs. And the project manager who got that approved emergency submitted a bill six months later that included fixing the stairs, fixing the wall they attached to, putting in new windows in the wall they attached to, um, fixing the storm gutters, and replacing the roof. So an emergency that we had approved and estimated at about $20,000 ended up being billed at over half a million. And that just shows how Scope Creek can change when an emergency ends, right? Our emergency ended geographically at the staircase, right? And once the stairs were supported and subsided, there was time to get quotes. There was time to use other tools of procurement to do it properly, right? And um, so for me, the idea is around what is the minimum amount of effort that can be done on the procurement side to alleviate the challenge. But that minimum amount of effort might include getting quotes. It might include getting bids with a shortened bid period. It might include all kinds of types of competition. And I know, Richard, that from your experience, you've had some experience with FEMA and done research with FEMA. So when they've declared an emergency, which means somebody else is going to pay. And whenever somebody else is paying, we have to follow their rules to make sure we get paid, right? So from your perspective on the FEMA side, have you seen anything special about when an emergency ends? No, I haven't. Actually, uh, the Hot Topics group really drew that distinction nicely in terms of the rules that, uh, that federal front funding bring with it that are relevant to the issue when emergency ends. The if, if the reader or the listeners here don't see anything else, get your hands on the FEMA Public Assistance Program and Policy Guide that covers what we call the uniform guidance, which is in Title II Code of Federal Regulations, Part 200, that governs the special requirements for any kind of federal funding, but in this case, those that attend disasters or emergencies. And uh, those link in also other code of federal regulations on certain sorts of expenditures. Why? Because FEMA, although it doesn't get in too much, at least at the state level, into the procurement policies, with respect to local governments and states, it has a consideration uh, or a concern about overall cost reasonableness. So many of these these rules that they have, like debris, for example, we're not facing that as much, obviously, in pandemic, but the v, uh, debris cleanup uh, has special uh, rules in the Code of Fe Federal Regulations. One of the things you'll see in the guide, for example, is that uh, as you're setting terms for the length of contracts, that those contracts in that emergency authority can only be go out as far as the circumstances exist. So you can't use the excuse to go an emergency and then build in a five-year contract for things like roof replacements and all the rest of it if the, the emergency is uh, you know, not going to go that long. So you know, take a look at uh, at that guide. I'd say if I was going to give a couple other uh, ideas is is the financial people sometimes have a better handle on the cost reimbursement issues on this because they know the rules on requesting rec uh, recovery or response uh, reimbursement and get in touch with them and your emergency operations centers. Second, look at things like the guide that FEMA puts out. And when you're writing your memoranda about decisions you're making about how you chose how long to go, accommodate those kinds of concerns in your memorandum because they're looking for those things. And also look at things like piggybacking, which that guide expresses a, a skepticism about in terms of using piggyback contracts to, to uh, contract for emergencies and also time and material and labor hours. So, so take a look uh, at that guide. But I'd say the thing I would leave you with is you've got to deal with the emergency. Don't let the rules get in the way of making sense in terms of what you do, in terms of how long it's taken to competitively procure and how long it takes a follow on contractor, for example, to get up to speed. Uh, make your professional judgment on these things. You might lose some funding reimbursement, but uh, you got to get the job done. Mike, anything that uh, you want to follow up with that that triggers in your mind? Yeah, just just a little bit. And that is, it's always hard to tell when something ends, right? 
it's sometimes hard to tell when it begins, but it's really hard to tell when things end. So I like to divide emergencies into the emergency response, which means minutes count, hours count. You do what you have to do and you save lives and you protect property. Then there's restoration, which is stabilizing the situation and which can take a little more time and you can start to get quotes. You can start to follow more involved process. And then there's, I mean, recovery, recovery is where you do that. And then restoration is where you rebuild. And that even FEMA expects you to do bids. I mean, they expect you to actually do competitions because there's time to do it. The fact it's funded by emergency doesn't mean it's emergent in the sense of procurement rules. And sometimes it's an emergent in the sense of procurement rules, and it's not a declared emergency that gets funding. It can be either one. And it's important to recognize that and not let people get carried away. They'll think they can spend it fast and there's no rules that apply. And actually for local government with FEMA, there's frequently more rules that apply. So you've got to be careful, follow all those recommendations that Richard made and make sure you know the rules and how to apply them. And like Richard said, talk to your financial people, especially the ones that administer other grants, because they'll understand a lot of those interactions already. And and with that, I could say thank you, everybody, for joining us on Legally Speaking. Thank you, Richard, for your always wonderful input. And we'll see you on the radio soon. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Hello, everybody. Um, Jenny Justiniano, and I'm here with Ina Bachelor, and she'd like to introduce herself and just kind of get to know her a little bit more. Go awesome. ahead. Thank you, uh, Jenny. My name is Ina Bachelor, and I am the purchasing manager for the city of Livonia, Michigan, which is a suburb about 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes outside of Detroit. We have a population of about 94,000 plus or minus. Um, and we have a purchasing staff of one. That would be me. I don't have any um, direct reports. So I like to say that my team are my, my departments. They are managers and those that primarily handle the purchasing function for them. The purchasing manager position is very new to the city of Livonia. So unlike most cities or municipalities who have had an established procurement office, department, um, lead probably uh, for you know, 15, 20, 30 years, this position was created five years ago. So we're talking about infancy in terms of procurement professionals pro being a resource to departments. Um, and I am the second person to hold this position. So there was my predecessor who was there for two years, and then there's me, and I'm on year number three. So this uh, assignment for me is very different than any other because I've always come into departments that had uh, staff. So my procurement career started in Tucson, Arizona as a contract officer, and I had moved to Tucson as a uh, newlywed, got married, um, my um, husband at the time was in the Air Force and I was looking for a job. So I applied to the city of Tucson and um, the director of the department at that time only hired people with no experience, which was unheard of. So he wanted people he could train his way to do procurement. And so I had the administrative skill set, but I had no procurement experience. And so he said I was perfect. That's exactly what he was looking for. So my introduction to procurement came at the city of Tucson. I was there for two years. He um, got out of the Air Force and we moved back to Detroit, uh, started a family. And when I got ready to move back, one of my college friends was a consultant for KPMG and she was working for the city of Detroit. And she said, hey, Ina, um, I heard you're coming back. They really need some good purchasing people here. Why don't you, why don't I put you in touch with the person who was the director at the time? And so I worked for the city of Detroit for 13 years, um, left just prior to their bankruptcy and the financial challenges that they are now uh, recovering from. And then I went to the city of Troy for five years, and now 
I've been with the city of Livonia for three. So the city of Livonia um, prior to five years ago was a largely decentralized purchasing uh, process. The finance director did the big stuff and the departments did all the, um, the little stuff, we'll call it. And so uh, what I found when I came there was that this was a purchasing environment with a lot of opportunity to bring a procurement and best practice mindset and apply it to people who had largely been doing their own thing. <laughs> um, they didn't really have the benefit of years of experience of process or procedure. It had been very decentralized and now just imagine trying to bring all those departments under one set of rules, under one set of forms it's been uh, very challenging, but at the same time, um, very rewarding. And so our biggest challenge at this point is standardization. Having the city from a procurement standpoint speak with one voice in terms of its policy, its process, its procedure, and um, its interpretation of ordinance and um, the rules that govern purchasing. Wow, that's great. I had no idea that you're a single woman shop and that's great. I think that a lot of our viewers can relate who are a single person shop, can appreciate all the efforts. So when the pandemic hit, what changes did you have to now pivot and implement and get everybody on board? When the pandemic hit, they sent everybody home. And we were fortunate in the city of Livonia that we saw very few layoffs as a result of being sent home. And being a one person um, purchasing team made me an integral part of our emergency operations center. I work very closely with the person who is in charge of the um, emergency operations center wanting to make sure that the first responders and the staff who had to report had what they needed, trying to overcome those challenges of sourcing and um, supply and inventory. Thankfully, we have a very well-developed um, emergency operations protocol and all of those trainings and all of that documentation, they had to put it into practice and it, it worked very well having to um, source uh, outside of the normal procurement process but still try to remain within the uh, guidelines of the ordinance and the best practices it was a phenomenal experience to appreciate what other departments have to do in order to keep the city going and i think it gave them an opportunity to appreciate uh, what procurement's role is in being the um, the engine behind that. You get in and start the key, but you have to have everything you need to make that engine go. If we don't buy the gas, if we don't buy the oil, if we don't buy the Lysol wipes so that the drivers can wipe everything down in between being on the in the vehicles to uh, maintain safety protocols. So it's been quite a ride. And as we kind of slow down just a little bit, now um, we're already thinking ahead to what if something like this happens again? Do while 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 uh, inventories are high, do we need to stockpile now? Even though we don't need it, even though we look good, do we need to create a reserve? Um, and we're learning that that is something that we need to consider. But at the same time, you still have to consider the shelf life of all of these products. Also, they're only good for two to three years. So we can't really stockpile that much because a lot of it won't be useful two to three years from now, but it has helped us in terms of planning ahead for challenges in the future. Well, congratulations on that. That's great. And I'm, I'm already picking up tips from you because we're <laughs> on that, you know, um, boat ride where we're hopefully return, some of us returning from home. So Thank you so much for sharing. I think that, you know, with this new segment of Visionary Views, you've shared definitely a wealth of information. And like I said, a solo shop is something to be commended for. And I appreciate your time. 
And we look forward to hearing more from you soon. Um, and thank you for participating. Have a great awesome. day. Thank you for the opportunity. Help, help, it's an emergency, who can help? As a procurement professional, are you the first person that comes to your end user's mind or the last? Hmm. If you're not the first, then I would encourage you to ask yourself, why do my end users not see the procurement department as an emergency responder? Do they not recognize us as a resource? Do they need training or maybe some education and some tips on how we can help them and how we can best serve them? Are we adding the value that we think that we are? Do we need to make ourselves more available and responsive? Do we need to say less no and provide more appropriate alternatives? Be honest with yourself when you ask these questions and should I dare challenge you to ask your end users? But be ready because they might tell you something you don't want to hear, but it might be something that you need to hear. So when they tell you those things, though, be ready to identify those and make adjustments. Otherwise, it's like having a fire extinguisher sitting on your desk. But then when somebody has a fire, you're like, sorry, figure it out, right? You have the answer, but you've got to adjust. Similarly, how are we arriving on scene during the crisis we're having with the supply chain? Do our suppliers see us with those fire extinguishers and those fire hoses ready to help fight the fire? Or are they just see us on the sidelines saying, help, help, who can help? I don't know, friends, but things that make you go, hmm. Hope it challenged you to think, my friends, and think about crisis and emergency responses and your true role in helping to put out the fire and not cause a different one entirely. Till next time, friends, stay safe and keep fighting those fires. <laughs>